there are fireworks going on around the world, but today we are going to have our own fireworks as we talk about Kota Rani. Yes, it's a, it's really a lovely, lovely book. I've just started reading it. I'm about halfway through, as you can see, it's marked over there. You can see where that indentation is. So I'm actually getting through it. There's so many stories. It's so beautifully woven. It's a star-crossed love story. It's in the midst of a historical saga of treachery, betrayal, murder. So it's got everything that you would want in a book. It's a class of civilizations between universal values and one of supremacy. It definitely piques our interest in the history of Kashmir, especially the powerful last queen of Kashmir. And it's surprising that at least I did not know about her. And she is Kota Rani. So I'm excited to have with me today Rakesh Kaul. He's an IIT gold medalist. He migrated to the US in 1972. He's got a distinguished business career as a CEO of publicly traded companies and the US, and he is the author of the bestseller, The Last Queen of Kashmir, Kota Rani. He's also written another book, Dawn, The Warrior Princess of Kashmir. And he actually hails from Kashmir and he's migrated to the US in 1972. And my God, his accolades are so many. So I will just tell you that he has lots of them. And I welcome Rakesh to Sipping Thoughts. Prakriti, you know, I can't tell you how delighted I am to be on your show. We have so much in common. You know, we are both graduates of UFC. You grew up in Rhode Island. I was there at Brown University. So delighted to be here. And uh, 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 good evening to your audience. And uh, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, yes, Kota Rani uh, is probably the greatest queen of the land. And uh, where should we begin? Well, let's tell us why did you want to write about her? What was it about her story that has intrigued you? And I know it has intrigued now many, many people because they're talking about a major motion picture. Lots, lots of excitement is all about. Yeah. So, so they, when I stumbled on the story, and it was a bit of a sad uh, way to stumble on the story, I found out that she had been a symbol of extraordinary feminine resistance in our history that had been carried orally mother through daughter. Now, what was this feminine resistance? This feminine resistance at its simplest level was a woman who was very cognizant of the world that she was part of, what it meant for her people, especially the women, the way of life that they could lead, their culture. And she was determined to be fiercely protective of it. And yet nobody knew about her. And then later on, I found out why she had been married. But as I researched her, I found out that she was extraordinarily beautiful. I mean, we talk about Cleopatra, but Cleopatra was not pretty. I mean, the historians say that she had a very seductive voice, but they were also quite honest and said she was not very pretty, whereas Kotarani was extraordinarily pretty. Over the course of her life, she had seven men who desired her. I some mean good, it. Everybody was some calling bad, <laughs> some downright ugly. And, you know, uh, she's the only woman who has historically defeated a jihadi army that was equipped with far superior forces. So if you like Cleopatra, if you like Chhatrapati Shivaji, <laughs> you have a two and one in there. Best of all, she's a real life role model. You know, we have Sita, we have Draupadi, but uh, the choices that Kota had to make with her life are choices that the modern young woman is faced with every day. And how she lived her life, how she protected her world, that's what makes the story relevant and interesting, and that's why I decided to take on the challenge of life. 
No, but it's actually beautifully woven because as you said, I think one of the things that intrigues us is how society possibly was very, very progressive. So sometimes you feel that, was it very progressive and we have regressed because you see these women, you hear their voices and you see how outspoken they are, how in charge they are, and they're actually making their own decisions. It is not like decisions are being thrust upon them. And that is what actually intrigued me about Kota Rani, whether she decided to marry, did not decide to marry, decided to get into a relationship. And so these were decisions that she was taking, very cognizant of that. But I want to come back to this because is why are all these female monarchs? Why are they forgotten? The only one that we actually really know of is Jhansi Ki Rani because maybe she's the one that has been taught to us in history. So uh, they're not forgotten. They were erased from history. So Kashmir, your audience will be pleasantly uh, delighted to hear, was called as Stri Dej, Stri Woman Dej Land. It was called Stri Dej because it was described as a land which was woman first in its culture. Kashmir has had many sovereign women rulers. Yashovati, Suganda Devi, Didda the Terrible, Kota Rani the Hero. But even if they were not sovereigns in their own right, even if they were just consorts, they were illustrious, immensely powerful. They were invariably the minister of finance. They controlled the treasury. And while Jansi Kirani has a place in history, these women, their contributions far exceeded the sacrifice of noble Jan Sikirat. What happened was that patriarchy entered, at least in the case of Kashmir specifically, but more generally in the rest of India, patriarchy entered. And in Kashmir, it happened in the early 14th century. And as soon as patriarchy entered, then all of the rights, roles, responsibilities that not just women rulers, but that women had were essentially erased. Very sad. But let's let's understand this because, you know, a lot of times when people are writing historical fiction it raises a lot of questions in our minds, like how accurate is the research? How much is actually known about these women and their life and their the way that their rulership was? Yeah, so uh, I don't write fiction. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, uh, I uh, am slotted in the historical fiction category because that's <laughs> the framework the publishing industry, industry works on. I follow the Indian literary tradition and in the Indian literary tradition, uh, there's a great responsibility uh, to be accurate to the facts as they are known. It took me seven years to collect the facts about Kota Rani. I had to go to sources in India, to Persia, to England, to Germany, in America. And I can tell you it was only because uh, of certain uh, historical advantages where I had helped set up some chairs of Indian studies that I had access and respect of these great scholars. And they shared their information with me. In fact, if you look at the book, you will see that I have not gotten a single testimonial from a celebrity. <laughs> the testimonials from, on this book are all from the greatest scholars of Kashmir. And the only person who has done her PhD on Kotarani, Teresa Wilkie in Germany. So those are the kinds of people that read this book 
and said yes. So as far as the facts are concerned, uh, that is absolutely a great story of her and her civilization. But then we should always remember that uh, in our literary form, uh, uh, we recognize that uh, Sahitya is an art form. And that art form has only one goal, which is to create rasa. You have to experience a certain rasa. We'll talk more about that later if that intrigues you. And so there's definitely art in it. And uh, the conversations and all that uh, reflect that art form. But be assured that this is a very authentic story. And we can talk more about how authenticity was introduced into it as we talk more. I want to go back to the correlation, though, because especially for present day Kashmir, because a lot of people will definitely ask this question. There was a PSA dossier that called Mehbooba Mufti Kota Rani. And I think that's when everybody again got interested in this queen. Why the reference and why did they link these two women? Well, uh, <laughs> we want the juice. We want the gossip. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, I think for your viewers, let me first share with them what the secret PSA dossier actually said. Uh, it said the subject, who is Mahbuba Mufti, is referred for her dangerous and insidious machinations and usurping profile and nature by the masses as daddy's girl and Kota Rani, based on the profile of a medieval queen of Kashmir who rose to power by virtue of undertaking intrigues ranging from poisoning of her opponents to pony, ponyarding. Ponyarding meaning ponyard is a small thin dagger. Yes, there are some similarities. I mean, uh, you can ostensibly say both are women rulers and uh, uh, for a while at least uh, both were ruling as, you know, single women. But there are also some deep, deep dissimilarities uh, to the degree <laughs> Kotarani poison somebody it was the general of a foreign army, not her political opponents. And conversely, the fundamental difference is that Kota Rani was deeply wedded to her culture's values of women's freedom, religious inclusivity, peace, and pursuit of knowledge. And at least based on my understanding of Mahbuba, she's on the opposite spectrum of that. She is not for women's freedom. She is not for religious inclusivity. Uh, she actually reportedly is partnering with people who uh, are not peaceful people and certainly uh, seeking knowledge has been replaced by a culture of blind faith. So there are some very distinct differences. So when you talk about Kota Rani and especially how she was very calculating, I mean, even using marriage as an act of diplomacy where she marries the, the man who killed her father and then to make sure that she is crowned Queen of Kashmir, she again marries the brother to retain the kingdom to the Hindus. So all of these, even her alliances that she made through marriage was to ensure that she was actually the queen. Or was it also to make sure that the Hindu rule continued? Because those two things to me were also maybe quite linked because she was the last Hindu queen also of Kashmir. Okay, uh, let's unpack, uh, let's unpack uh, those two questions. The first one, uh, when you say calculating, the story starts with Kotarani uh, in her graduation exam, and all these very tough uh, scholars are asking her very difficult questions. And I'm sure uh, you read those questions and her answers. 
And at the end of the day, what those scholars are trying to do is they are trying to help her understand as to what is a woman's greatest strength. What is a woman's greatest strength? I just want everybody in your audience to think about that. And the point these scholars are trying to make is that a woman's greatest strength is presence of mind. She never loses presence of mind. Doesn't matter what situation she is facing. But there is a second, which in the very first chapter, she gets asked. She gets asked the question, what is faster than the mind? Again, I want your audience to think about it for a second. What is faster than the mind? And her answer, the correct answer is desire. She is able to even faster than the mind can process, figure out if she is the object to desire for someone who wants to engage with her as a friend or a foe. <laughs> then, of course, once she's figured that out, lightning fast, that person is toast. Sometimes that toast is burnt. Sometimes that too is consumed with that. So true, so true. Sorry, I had a little bit of an audio issue. But I want to ask... Uh, can, I, can I answer the second part of it? First, before you answer the second part, yes. I want to know from you, what is the greatest strength of a woman? Presence of mind. Presence of mind. That's the greatest strength of a woman. Go ahead, please do answer the second part of the question also. So, uh, you know, lazy historians uh, who want to uh, label uh, things uh, say, okay, uh, you know, that was Hindu rule and then there was Islamic rule and she was the last uh, Hindu queen and then the Islamic rule followed. Yeah, I mean, if one wants to uh, label it that way, that's fine. You know, it's a point of view. But in Kota's time, that's not how it would have been described. In Kota's time, it would and is seen very different. First, the Kashmirians at that time would have seen it as a continuation of the long war. Uh, this concept of the long war is not well understood in India. Uh, I provide the history in the book as to what this concept is. Uh, so in a sense, this book is also of some value for those who are interested in military conflict. Uh, only recently did General Petraeus in the United States adopt this military uh, phrase. And what was this long war? Uh, Kashmir was the crown of Indic civilization's point of view. The world is family. And the opposition to that was the world is split into the insider and the outsider. 
Whereas in Kashmir, this notion of the other was considered to be the greatest evil. The notion of the other was brought into Kashmir in the 14th century. And in the book, the fakir is the exponent of that ideology. And that's the long war that is being fought. Do you see humanity as family or do you see humanity divided into those who are like you or with you and those who are against you? And India generally and Kashmir specifically rejected this exclusivist idea that leads to the concept of the other. Something that you show beautifully in the book, I think, as a melting pot, because you see a lot of cultures that are intermingling with each other, coexisting with each other. And the second thing that you talk a lot about in your book, at least I noticed, was food. You go into a great deal of depth into food and at least what was being served and how it was being served. And so both of these facts really fascinated me. So let's talk about food first. Uh... Uh, I, 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 there's a scene in the book uh, where there's a big Kashmiri dinner celebration and the chef, the Vaza, comes and he goes to the guests and he asks each one uh, how they like the food. And so Kota asks him, you know, a question. She asked him a question very similar to what you have asked. And he gives a very interesting answer. He says, our food binds the Kashmiris to each other and to our land. The more one eats Kashmiri food, the more I know that they are true Kashmiris. <laughs> No. I mean, my, my mouth was salivating at times <laughs> when I was reading the book as you go into a lot of detail about the food. So nature had blessed Kashmir that in the first millennium, you could think of it as New York City. It was sitting atop of the Silk Route. So there were Jewish people in Kashmir, there were Chinese, uh, Persians, it was a melting pot, and the characters in the book, uh, 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 you know, reflect that. Uh, but uh, because of that reason, because nature also blessed Kashmir with fish and meat and vegetables, wine. Uh, in fact, uh, Kalana says uh, grapes that are uh, rare in heaven are easily found in Kashmir, and Kashmir had great wine. So... Uh, so food was a very important component, but let's not also forget part of the love for food was also because Kashmir uh, suffered terrible famines. The weather could turn bad, it could turn nasty. And in fact, there is a pretty horrific scene in the book uh, that relates to cannibalism. So uh, you may not have reached that part yet, but yeah. So Kashmiris, Kashmiris have a close relationship with their food. One of the things that definitely I want to understand from you, and especially what I've heard, is there were no taboos in Kota's Kashmir. The body was a temple, contrary to the misunderstandings and the social conflicts today, revolving around the notions of feminine purity. The Kashmiri way defines purity as living in the reality of consciousness. Can you tell us a little bit more about the no taboos, especially the fact that menstruating women were granted the highest of honors and were believed to be at the height of their cyclical femininity. And in religious gatherings, she would be seated right next to the guru. So this is very different from the way that today menstruating women are referred to. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, uh, I mean, the menstruating fluid at the end of the ceremony was used as the tilak. Yes. I mean, uh, so again, this is uh, patriarchy coming in. 
and with their cockamamie notions, uh, fundamentally not recognizing that the body is beautiful, the body is a temple, the body is sacred, and the body is the greatest creative, the feminine body is the greatest creative engine. Uh, it's the bearer of life without which uh, we would be nothing. And it showed in the customs. Uh, people are constantly astonished uh, when I uh, talk about the fact that uh, there was a very healthy uh, uh, sexuality in Kashmir. And uh, there's a line in the book at the transition point at the very end where Kota Rani says to Shamir, he has captured her. He says, she says, I'm not a trophy and not your sherbet. So how did it reflect in the lives of common people? There was a very, you know, people, I see people in India occasionally, some groups uh, going around and protesting against Valentine's Day, uh, thinking it's a Western import. And in Kashmir, there was a beautiful festival called Madna Teodashi, which happens in spring around Valentine's Day, which is dedicated to the god Kama, god of love. And it's a beautiful custom, you know. Uh, the women viewers of your show should ask their husbands to celebrate it next year. So the night before the <laughs> day, uh, the husband would take pitchers of water and he would put flowers, jasmine, roses, and other flowers in it so that the water by early morning would become fragrant. And then in the morning, he would give a body scrub to his wife with that fragrant water. They would then go to the gardens and there would be other couples and families and they would picnic. Then they would come back and they would pray to Kamade. And then after that, they have a great meal and have make love. It was, it was a festival dedicated to women. There were just no taboos. And for example, in India today, you'll find that there are many gurus. Most of them are men. Most of them are men. That is not true in Kashmir. All Kashmiri pundits, our highest guru is Ard Trambaka. Trambaka Rishi had a daughter, Ard Ha. We are all descendants of him, spiritual tradition. The highest initiations were done by women Bharavis. Ramakrishna in Bengal, who was a follower of the Kashmiri tantric practices, was initiated by a Bharavi. It is very hard for people today to understand what civilization we had, where women had this freedom, where women were the transmitters of the highest spiritual truths, where women were the creative force, and where women experience love of the highest order. Now, take children. It's not that Ganesh was not seen as Shiva's son, yes. But most of the time in the text, Ganesh is referred to as Parvati Putra. What does that tell you? So now that you brought up mythology, I have to ask you because her brother's name was Ravan and her dad's yes. name was Ramachandra. So the yes. connotations, and I wanted to understand that. And I actually went searching because there are places where his name is spelled with a W and there's places that it's spelled with a V. I wanted to understand from your perspective, do we have a different notion even of mythology now? 
because the naming of, of your child as Ravan is not something that would be done today. It's a very, you know, when I stumbled on it, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, quite a stunner for me too. You know, you're absolutely right. Uh, first, the Kashmiri Ramayana is uh, quite fascinating that uh, like some other Ramayans, uh, the parentage of Sita is quite interesting. Yes. Sita is in the Kashmiri Ramayana the daughter of Mandotri and Ravan. And she's born when Ravan is away on the expedition and Mandotri, you know, as was typical, asks the astrologer to cast her stars. And the astrologer tells her that one day her father will look at her with lust in his eyes and she will be the death of him. So Mandotri immediately puts Sita in a little box and she floats down the river where Janak finds her. Ravan was very clearly a great devotee of Shiva and Kashmir was a center of Shaivism. So, yes, it's, it, it raises a very perplexing question that you have asked, and I leave it to other scholars to dig into uh, Valmiki's Ramayana and other Ramayans. Uh, we'll never know the answer, but I will say one other thing, which relates to the earlier one. I personally find the Kashmiri Ramayan more interesting than the Valmiki Ramayana. You've given us something more to read now. <laughs> and why is that? I find the Kashmiri Ramayana interesting. I mean, the Valmiki Ramayana is a great book. One should definitely read. Because the Kashmiri Ramayana is Sita-centric, whereas Valmiki Ramayana is Ram-centric. Kashmiri Ramayana has Sita's point of view and because it is Kashmir, there's a lot more of nature in it. There is flora, fauna, there's dance, there's music, there's song. It's just a more colorful, fun story. Now, my last question as we end. So would you say that Kota Rani was a feminist? Was she the feminist of her times? Go ahead, sorry, I, I'm sorry. So I said my last question. So would you say Kota Rani was a feminist and for her time, she was probably leading the way of feminism? I would say to call her as a feminist would be to diminish her. Because when you look at the unfortunate hole that society finds itself in, uh, feminism has been reduced to uh, just trying to get equal rights, just trying to be able for women to be able to lead their lives safely. Uh, I would say Kota Rani uh, is feminism plus, which is what is more authentic to our culture. And Feminism plus, basically, I've written elsewhere about it, is not about equality. It's about what I call dynamic symmetry. Dynamic symmetry meaning that when a man and a woman are together, they are equal. But if the man isn't present, then the woman is whole on her own. And the one thing that she definitely has versus men the feminine pathway is the pathway of creativity. Now, women are more in touch with it than men, but men have a feminine side too. And that's an important dimensionality for us because 
future societies are not going to be driven by command and control. They'll be driven by creativity. And the sooner we discover that both for women especially, if we let them unlock their full potentiality, but also for men equally, if we let them unlock their feminine creative side, that's the force that will make India and other parts of the world, if they believe in it, achieve their life of full potential. The feminine to me is the power of the creative. And Beautiful. that is what Kota believed in. That, and as part of being creative, Kota understood that one had to have the right to be swatan, to be free, to be able to make individual decisions. And she says in the book, my power lies in my free will. Very beautifully said. As, as we close, are you writing something else? Are you, are you in the middle of another project? And can we expect another book from you soon? Well, I'm always working on creative things. I hope we can come back and talk about my second book, which was published by Penguin, Dawn, The Warrior Principle of Kashmir. Uh, and yeah, I'm always doing something creative and I hope to share that with the world. Yeah, it's all moving well. So, well, definitely pick it up. I'm telling you, very intriguing story. It's very easy to read and so many multiple stories within that are woven in. Totally, totally. I'm totally enthralled and I can't wait to finish the book. So thank you, Rakesh, for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, thank you and thank you to your audience. And uh, do provide feedback on the story. That's what an author looks for. And have a great, great evening and a great July 4th.